Good morning. My name is Ethan Gilbreth. I'm a senior at the University of North Carolina. This is, I'm the uh, co-president of the, uh, well, sole co-president, but um, <laughs> uh, I'll be graduating this May. I'm sole co-president of the uh, campus fellowship and uh, spoken here a few times before, but this is the first time I guess I'm reading my own words, so very happy. So I'll start out. Uh, has anyone ever seen the uh, Rene Magritte painting, The Treachery of Images, or uh, also known as This Is Not a Pipe? It's a pretty simple portrait. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a portrait of a pipe, an old school pipe, and it says, This Is Not a Pipe, underneath the text. It belies to me a uh, fundamental question that revises my worldview every so often. It is a philosophical question of map territory relations that perception of the world always intercedes between the reality and the person. It's like a map that can only be truly accurate, and it would require a scale of a mile to a mile, and would be very ineffective. I study economics and global studies at UNC, and economics is a field of extraordinarily treacherous images. The dismal science was so named for its despondent outlook of the world's driving forces being reduced to mere matters of scarcity and supply-demand dynamics. And in doing so, it certainly downplays and ignores certain qualities of human experience and mankind. Economics is subject to a great deal of problems between map and territory. Every model rests on some basic assumptions and observations. But when compared to the reality of policy and practicality, many of the underpinnings of this, these thoughts are challenged by the complexity of the world and the way people behave. And in getting to truth, the truth can suck. We have personalized communities that reflect our subjective truths back to us so that we can exist in some bad faith away from the real measure of objective truth. Our subjective truth is like an economic model. It relies on the basic assumptions that we already have, and as such, we're kind of like that guy in the Matrix who knows he's in the Matrix, but chooses to live there anyway. And such is the callous nature of discourse and information gathering. Our knowledge of pipes is coming from portraits of pipes. Which is fine, it really is. I think if I never watched cartoons as a kid, I might not, might not even know what a corncob pipe looks like. I certainly wouldn't become a pipe expert, replete with knowledge covering the fundamentals of pipe construction, evolution, pipe maintenance, and etc. It wasn't taught at my high school, nor is it one of those weird easy A courses at UNC, <laughs> I think. If I didn't know what a pipe was, I would be very grateful to Magritte for his highly educational portrait. But at the end of the day, his portrait is just that. It's two-dimensional. It's not a pipe. It's just a representation of it. There is a perception of it, and the medium of that perception intercedes with the truth of it. It is a map of a pipe and in viewing it, I cannot, or rather, I should not, say that I know what a pipe is. And don't worry, my pipe metaphor is coming to a close here in a minute. <laughs> in the post-fact age of modern media, we are giving a lot of paintings of pipes based on what we already know of pipes, and now I'm done. And it is an oft-discussed topic that people, particularly in my generation, live in a bubble or an echo chamber or anything like that. They function to entrench us in the positions that we already have, confirming our truth that we already knew, inflating the bubble while it never bursts. Confirmation bias, so to speak. If we see an article, even with some kind of scientific proof, supporting some cruel or weird hypothesis, we would reject it out of hand, like cigarettes are good for your lungs, or Duke is better than UNC. We should reject these ideas, and we rightfully do. And in our search, for truth and meaning in the universe, we are bound in some capacity to promote a free exchange of ideas. But we come to a crossroads when we encounter moral philosophies that clash with our sensibilities and ethics. And philosophically, I constantly find myself asking about the nature of truth. As with all Sisyphean tasks of philosophical debate, the question of objective truth has been asked time and again. Is mankind the measure of all things, and is something true simply because we believe it? Or is something in its true form from its correspondence to reality? Like, or is it true by putting it into practice? Pragmatically, I think the fake news issue has little bearing on my understanding of 
truth as a concept. It's a fairly conscious human deception and, you know, has very little value to truth as a concept. But, along with my cynical nature, it does inspire me in some way to think that we as society should believe in a single common truth. That if we accept a single universal truth, we can be humble, we can be explorers, and we can be united together as learners to pursue to its fullest the meaning of this common truth. But my global studies and economics curriculum says that such a truth is impossible. The differences between people across the world build a rainbow of truth. Sometimes beautiful and other times highlighting with great despair just how impossible a universal truth could be. So it's my goal to go beyond the models. When I leave UNC in this place, I don't want to leave my maps behind, but I need to explore the territory as much as I can, and I'm happy to see all the little fragments of truth in my journey. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Paige Henderson. I am a junior studying public policy and sociology. And I'm honored to be here today speaking to you for the second time with Campus Community Church's campus ministry. This past fall semester, I had the opportunity to study Arabic and international relations in Jordan. For those of you who don't know, Jordan is located below Syria and east of Israel and Palestine. I was able to travel to both Israel and Palestine after my program. And my experiences there led me to truly realize the nuances of conflict and come away with a new understanding of truth. Truth resides in lived experiences. In the stories people tell of their life, the people they know, the places they've been, interactions they've had. Truth does not reside in news stories, academic papers, nor governmental policies and actions, at least never the whole truth. And it took me going to Palestine and Jerusalem to realize this. Because when we talk about faraway places and faraway problems, it's only natural to generalize, simplify, to take what knowledge we have, whether extensive or limited, and then take a stance. I know I had done so when initially pondering the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But being compassionate takes more than choosing to support one versus another, this versus that, black versus white. What isn't easy coming, what takes awareness, intention, and compassion is to sit in the gray. I want to share some stories that taught me about the nuances of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, prompted me to sit in the gray, and made me reevaluate the nature of truth. And I've changed the name in this story for privacy reasons. Muhammad met us in the city of Hebron, near a 45-foot-tall iron chain-link security fan fence, manned with Israeli defense soldiers carrying M16s. The city of Hebron, located in Palestine, also referred to as the West Bank, was partitioned in 1994 after, visiting, after a visiting Israeli settler entered the mosque during Ramadan prayers and opened fire. He killed 29 people and injured over 100. <coughs> Afterwards, the Israeli government, fearing retaliation, decided to partition the city, Palestinian, Israeli, and turn half of the mosque into a temple. Hebron is known for having some of the most violent and aggressive Israeli settlers. Muhammad told us stories of settlers dropping rocks on Palestinians, and one time how they poured urine on him from their apartment above the market. Now 27, Muhammad has lived in Hebron his whole life. He was in his prime childhood years when the second intifada broke out. Palestinians consider the intifada an uprising against Israeli occupation, 
while Israelis consider this period of intensified conflict part of an ongoing terror campaign. Both may be true. Muhammad told us a story about how him and his friends used to play soccer in the streets, see a tank coming, pick up the ball, and when the tank passed, resumed playing. That was his childhood. That is his truth. He told us how, at age 10, he would crouch behind his garden wall and learn how to spot a specific tilt of a helicopter. The tilt that meant bullets would soon rain down. During this tour of Hebron, because we are not Palestinian, we were allowed to enter the Israeli side. It was a ghost town. I saw a small Jewish, Jewish child riding his tricycle down a huge hill, a wide grin on his face, a kippah on his head, and I could only imagine the joy he felt similar to the joy I used to feel, letting gravity guide me down the hill when I was small. It struck me into silence that this was this child's experience. This was his neighborhood, his normal, where he would find his passions, practice his religion, where he sits around the kitchen table with his parents and lays his head to rest at night. Growing up here, will impact how he comes to perceive the world around him. This is his truth. He did not choose where he grew up. And when he turns 18, he will not have a choice but to serve in the Israeli Defense Forces. Accessing stories of lived experience is difficult, especially from across the Atlantic. Further, Seeking out stories of lived experience, listening, and treating them as wholly valid can be messy, can muddle our beliefs and stances, and when they don't put, fit perfectly into black or white, or when they seem to simultaneously deconstruct and still provide evidence for our preconceived notions. And while it may be uncomfortable and confusing, this, to seek and listen and sit, is to acknowledge truth, authentic truth. Good morning. Hello, my name is Sean McCaffrey. I'm a computer science major, uh, and I'm grateful to have the opportunity to speak here again. I thought that for the subject of truth, I could talk about how I have come to find some of mine. I grew up Unitarian Universalist at the Unitarian Universalist Church of Charlotte, and through my coming of age program, as well as the regular Sunday religious education classes we had, the exposure that I gained to various spiritual and religious ideas clued me into the general touchstones of what most religions consider to be good. Being kind, recognizing the inherent worth and dignity in every person, and caring about others in general. My parents also, I think, did a pretty good job of solidly convincing me of some fundamental ways that the world works. Things like the fact that I can only control myself and not those around me. That being positive is the way to go and that helping others is good. These understandings have been immensely helpful in guiding me in my actions day to day and have generally made me a better person. These truths, however, are only part of the picture and a, th and a thought that I always had nagging me was why are these ideas good or valuable? Coming to college made this uncertainty prominent in my thinking because I found that governing by feeling alone could be misleading, and I struggled with how I could have a concrete grasp of the world around me and what I should do in it, while also understanding the equally as important question of why. I had come to shrug off dogma as a means of answering this because I had read quite a few in learning about religions, and the very premise seemed to run against what I had been taught and come to know. 
that I alone could determine my truth because something at the core of doing so requires a conscious effort. That something could be true all day long and yet not mean anything to me if I hadn't gained an understanding about it. A class that I took last semester, however, finally pointed me in a direction that felt real. It was conducted in a way that prioritized engagement instead of memorization with the readings above all else. It's called The Fundamentals of Politics and is taught by Dr. Goldberg. The course's name always requires a bit of explanation. It isn't a class on modern politics, but on the principles that govern, govern human behavior and how the political world ultimately reflects these. Through discussions that we had that were mainly focused on readings of Plato, I grew in my understanding of what the background of all these beliefs I had learned in the past were. They were all trying to reflect truth in the world and portray it as good. And when I say truth here, I don't mean a dogmatic one, but a living truth, a constantly growing understanding of what truly is, what fundamentally holds in the world around us and in ourselves. This led me to find that truth itself is what is good. In the dialogues that we read, speaking with, those speaking with Socrates have various conceptions of the right thing to do. But Socrates takes the same tact in every discussion he has, sincerely seeking the truth of the situation with whomever he is speaking. After agreeing on what is, which is what usually takes the majority of the time in the discussion, the decision at hand generally becomes trivial. Socrates operates on another level in discussion, looking at every dialogue through the same lens of seeking what is in the world and then deciding what is right instead of deciding what is right and seeking to justify it with what is. This latter strategy doesn't make a whole lot of sense. If I haven't examined what is, what it is that I'm making a decision on, how could I possibly know what is right? The simplicity and seeming obviousness of this idea amazed me, but at the same time I realized that I all too often could just act based on what feels right, and yet those actions could still have negative consequences that I hadn't even tried to consider. While conceding that it is unreasonable to think that we can see the entire truth of every single situation, Socrates still places the seeking of it as the highest priority to be strived for as much as possible. A relatively benign example of when I acted without seeking the whole tru truth is when I loaded up with student organization involvement my sophomore year. There were so many options to do good and it seemed like I couldn't do enough because there was always a new problem to be solved or position to be filled. It was exhilarating for a little while. And then other parts of my life started to suffer. It's hard to be entirely consumed with involvement and at the same time continue to succeed in running or school. That was difficult because it wasn't that I had not learned to take care of myself, but that at least morally I had always perceived my purpose as doing things that would benefit others, and myself vicariously through meeting new people and learning new things. However, following this perception without understanding the full perspective of why it was valuable blocked me from considering what else was valuable, in considering the holistic picture that I need to care about my well-being as well as other people's, even if helping others feels inherently right by itself. Now. I do my best to seek the most understanding that I can about an action or situation that I'm in, and let that, in addition to the notions I've learned and continue to learn from my lived experience, guide what I do. Connecting this back to the understandings of right action that I was questioning, in applying the search for truth to these embedded ideas, I found that all of them seemed to point towards the concept that we are truly in this for something greater than ourselves. That humanity is its own being made up of each of us, much like our bodies are made up of individual cells. This result of seeking truth has helped me a lot in understanding why things like helping people and being positive make sense, why, are there, why they are inherently valuable things to be as a human. This perspective, as well as, 
as continuing to ensure that I search for the truth of what is before anything else has so far made life make a lot more sense. I appreciate everyone allowing me to share my truth here, and thank you.